to help you do a, a good job of earnestly working to serve all youth in the state of Pennsylvania. I'm also an assistant professor at Rutgers University just across the pine in New Jersey. And today we have with us, um, of course, you know, all of you know, or most of you know, Julia Terry, who is program director at PA Humanities. We have Dr. Meg Paisley joining us today from University of Connecticut um, by way of the Midwest. And Meg has graciously uh, 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 agreed to join us and really share with us her research expertise in working with LBGTQ plus youth, young people. Um, Meg goes by they and them. I go by she and her, Julia as well. And then we also, lastly, those of you should see another familiar face who've been with us um, for quite some time. And that would be our resident librarian who's always happy to join us and help us walk through how to do Teen Reading Lounge very well. So hopefully for you, many of you recognize Tammy, right? Many of you may recognize Tammy, who has been Tammy Blount from Erie, Pennsylvania, who's been working with us for probably eight or so years doing Teen Reading Lounge and just leading the way and helping those newer sites to come into our community and understand how best to work with youth and put them first as we serve them in our public library spaces, as well as in our school libraries and other spaces throughout the state of Pennsylvania. So welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us in the chat and um, we will get started. I'm going to turn it over to Meg and they will share with us, give us a grounding of the language and tech, uh, the language and information. I was going to say technology, but Katie's managing the technology associated with the LBGTQ plus community and how we should think about our work with young people. Meg? Thank you. Yes. I think we did this slide already, so we'll move on. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here with you all. I'm bringing um, about 15 years of practice experience with LGBTQ plus youth and families in community contexts primarily, which of course involves libraries and schools and out of school programming. Um, and my research is around the same areas. So um, as Valerie said, I want to just start with sort of um, grounding us all in LGBTQ youth identities and the social context that they're situated in, just so we're all on the same page. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna start with um, just a little bit of terminology. We're not gonna get into all of the language surrounding LGBTQ identities because that could take us a whole hour and probably isn't exactly what you're here for. So um, just some general basics. When we talk about gender identity, um, we use the term cisgender and transgender. Um, cisgender means that a person's sex assigned at birth um, and their current gender or gender identity are in alignment. So somebody's born, the doctor says it's a boy, and the person has whatever age they are, they identify as a boy or a man, right? And so it's consistent. Transgender is when the sex assigned at birth and gender identity are not in alignment. They're not the same. So in the example before, baby's born, doctor says it's a boy, usually based on what we can see of a body. Um, and as that child grows up, um, at whatever age they say, that doesn't actually fit me. I'm not a boy. Maybe I'm a girl. Maybe I'm non-binary. There's lots of variations. And so in some way, those are not aligned. Um, and so identifying as transgender can include binary identities. So the example I gave of um, somebody who's um, uh, sex assigned at birth is male and their gender identity is a woman, right? There's a binary um, change there. Um, but it also includes non-binary identities. So somebody whose sex assigned at birth is male or female, and now their gender identity is non-binary. Next slide, please. Um, and so when we think about terminology around sex and gender, um, sex assigned at birth is usually male and female, sometimes intersex, um, which I'm happy to answer questions about later. We just don't have a ton of time but right now to get fully into it. And gender is really this inner sense of who we are, how we define our gender. Um, and so this is much broader and goes beyond this binary of male and female. So man, woman, both, neither, non-binary, some other gender, an absence of gender, right? Somebody who might say, I'm a gender, I don't have a gender. And so there's lots of variation in terms of how somebody might identify their gender. Next slide, please. And then another piece around gender is this difference between gender identity and expression. So gender expression is the physical ways that we express our gender. So 
our clothing, our mannerisms, our behaviors. Um, these are often rooted in sort of sometimes stereotypical ideas about what it means to be masculine or feminine. Um, and so some examples might be, again, masculine, feminine, more androgynous, um, a combination of masculine and feminine, things like that. And so it's important to note that gender identity and expression both exist on continuums. They're not a binary um, and that they don't have to align with each other. So you might have a non-binary teen in your program who has a more feminine gender expression. Those two things can coexist. It doesn't erase their non-binariness, right? Um, we could have a trans man who has a more androgynous gender expression or a cisgender woman who has a gender expression that is perceived as more masculine. So there's lots of ways that gender identity and expression um, can show up. And then moving on to sexual orientation, we often think of sexual orientation as sexual, right? In terms of like who people are um, sexually attracted to, but it really goes a lot more beyond that. So we have physical attraction, um, as well as romantic and emotional attraction. Um, again, we could spend a lot of time on this and I'm not going to, but I just name that because um, particularly among youth, you might hear youth saying things like, I'm um, sexually attracted to many genders, but I'm really only romantically attracted to one or two or something along those lines. And those distinctions are really important. Um, next, please. So sort of these broad categories of sexual orientation, we have um, what are referred to as monosexual identities, which is attraction to one gender. Um, and so this could be somebody who's gay or lesbian, heterosexual, um, sometimes queer. You'll see queer in all of these because it is a lot of a, more of a self-label, self-identification, um, and it could be any one of these. So plurisexual identities um, is attraction to more than one gender. So this could be bisexual, pansexual, queer, um, and this would be people who, um, I try to avoid things like the opposite gender because that gets it a binary, but are attracted to just more than one. It could be their own and somebody else. It could be two different from themselves. There's lots of ways that that could happen. And then asexual identities, um, there's, we're still struggling with like the best sort of succinct definition for asexual identities because there's so many different ways that this can show up. Um, but generally it's a, either a lack of um, or limited sexual or romantic attraction to others. Um, can be both, could be one or the other. So moving into LGBTQIA plus youth in their social context, um, you may have seen this before. It's the social ecological system systems model by Bronfenbrenner, and I'm not gonna go into all of it, but the general idea here is that all of the youth that you're working with um, are part of these integrated systems in their life. So if we think of the youth in the middle, they bring all of their sort of socio-demographic, socio-cultural, their medical history, their mental health, all of that kind of stuff, their individual level experiences, but those don't exist right in a vacuum, right? They're, they have all the, these other systems. So directly surrounding them, their family, their friends, if they go to church, um, their school, these are systems that they're directly involved with. So um, TRL would be in the micro system, right? It's people that they're directly involved with connecting with on a regular basis. And then the further out you go, sort of the further removed, I guess, but still has an impact on the, the young people. So we see things like neighbors, the media, local policies, and then you get out further and we have the broader sort of socio-political system, which is a big deal, particularly for LGBTQ youth right now, which I'll talk about next. So there's lots of ways that the socio-political context can impact LGBTQ plus youth. Um, one of the key ways that it's happening right now is through this onslaught of legislation that's targeting LGBTQ people, particularly youth and particularly trans youth um, across the country. So this has been probably since about 2021, we've started seeing this steady increase. In the last couple of years, we've seen the most. Um, last year was a record year. This year is likely looking to be another record year, not in a good way, um, with more than 500 bills proposed across the U.S., um, in both in 2023 and so far in 2024. Um, some of the areas of focus are um, sort of quote unquote bathroom bills. And these are bills that restrict access to gender specific spaces. So, um, you know, I just moved to Connecticut from Kansas and one of they have one of the most restrictive uh, bathroom bills in the country that says um, 
basically it's it's all it's all sex assigned at birth. So there's potential criminal um, liability, all kinds of um, really hard stuff. And this is not just youth; it's youth and adults. There's also a lot of bills focused on gender affirming care. And so this would be medical and mental health care that is affirming of trans youth's gender identity. Um, and so bans or serious restrictions, I think it's like 23 states right now have restrictions or bans on this type of care. We're seeing book bans um, in schools and beyond schools, um, bills prohibiting trans girls from participating in girls sports teams, sometimes at the school level, sometimes, uh, sometimes at the high school level, sometimes intercollegiate um, and beyond. And then school policies. And so some of the ways that this is showing up is um, reforcing teachers, librarians, social workers to report to parents if a youth is using a different name or pronoun than they were assigned at birth um, and things like that. And so what we see with this legislation is that whether the legislation is passed or not, it's associated with pretty poor outcomes. So we're seeing increased depression, anxiety, um, increased suicidality and suicide attempts, um, gender dysphoria, lacking supportive resources, um, and, and many more negative impacts. So that was on a national level. I did wanna provide just a bit of context about what's happening in Pennsylvania. Um, in this current legislative session, there are four active anti-LGBTQ bills in the state. Um, Last I checked, they were not, they had not moved forward to any point of like being passed, um, but it's important to note that they're there. Um, and these focus on gender affirming care, um, child custody issues related to LGBTQ youth, school sports, and then discussion of LGBTQ content in elementary schools. Um, and just to note, three of these were also active last year and did not pass. Um, it seems likely based on what I saw that that's not something that will go forward and pass. But as I said, even when they're proposed, they still have a harmful impact on uh, queer and trans young people. A um, couple more slides. I think you all will get copies of the slides. Um, this is a link that you can click and it shows um, some data around um, LGBTQ equality in Pennsylvania. I just picked out a few sort of good things and not so good things that I read from the report. Um, basically, the policy climate in Pennsylvania is designated as fair, so it's right in the middle. A couple of positives that are happening is um, there are non-discrimination laws for both sexual orientation and gender identity, um, and that law does include students and in schools. Um, conversion therapy has been banned, um, and there's no negative laws, so these bathroom bills that I talked about, like in my former state, um, there's, there's not the presence of those. A couple of the downsides, there's no protections for um, LGBTQ youth in child welfare or for LGBTQ parents in the child welfare system. And the hate crime law is not inclusive of LGBTQ people. So again, these are just a couple of things I pulled out. It's not everything. Um, here, this is within that report. So if you want to look more in detail, kind of figure out where your county's at. Um, the good news of this is that there's no bans right? We don't see any orange on here um, for any of the counties, but we can see that only 37% of the population um, as of the time of this report was protected by state or county, um, sorry, by county legislation um, supporting LGBTQ people. So that was all the hard stuff. The good news is that ag there's really important research that came out a few years ago that shows that access to just one supportive adult can reduce LGBTQ youth suicide risk by 40%. This is something I share pretty much with whoever I talk to because any of us in this space can be that one person. And 40% is a huge number when we're talking about suicide risk. This can be a parent, a teacher, a therapist, librarians, after school staff, a neighbor, a doctor, right? There's so many people that this could be, um, which is why I'm so excited that you all are here, right? All right, that was a lot. That was a lot of grounding. I want to talk a bit about some of the research on strategies for engaging LGBTQIA youth in libraries and out of school time spaces. Valerie, did you want to jump in with something before I do that? Yep. Just wanted to um, again, if you feel we we have 
question and answer breaks built in. And so if there's a burning question, I just want to remind everyone to go ahead and, and drop your question in the Q&A or in the chat box. And we are appreciative of that. We'll give you a chance to wiggle around. Um, and just again, want to thank you, Meg, for what you're sharing and um, just help people to understand that this is a lot of information that helps us to contextualize what the experiences are of young people. And that, you know, it's just important for us, those of us who identify as allies, who come to this work naturally, organically, or because we have a friend or family member who fits into this community. Um, this just gives us a lot. And because you'll have access to a recording and or the slides, we, we understand if you can't remember it all, um, that's perfectly fine and okay. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to, to shout that out before folks say, how am I gonna remember this all? It's okay if you don't, that's perfectly normal. Absolutely, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I'm trying to squeeze in as much as we can, but this should be, Wherever you're at on your journey, this is like one part of it, right? So um, thank you. All right, next slide. So I want to talk about libraries as spaces for LGBTQ youth and how folks in this space can um, support LGBTQ youth. Um, I will note that a slide a little bit later, I'm going to talk specifically about rural communities and spaces because I recognize that some of the things we talk about may not be... Um, be able to be done the same way in every space, right? We have to think about our context that we're in. Um, and so I just wanna name that up front. So there's a ton of research that shows that school-based groups for LGBTQ youth may not be accessible or available for all LGBTQ people. So this is GSA's Gender and Sexuality Alliances. Um, They're particularly less available for queer students of color. Um, that has been shown across the board for a number of reasons. and so community-based groups and spaces are particularly important. Um, and libraries can serve as a really important space for that to happen. Um, access to supportive and affirming adults, um, providing groups that might be focused on community building, developing relationships and social support, education, book clubs, right? There's lots of ways that groups could be formulated um, for and with LGBTQ people. Um, creating resource lists or book lists, book recommendations, access to um, information, and we have tons of resources to share with you at the end of the at the end of the slides. Um, engaging in community training and events, right? How do we shift a climate or um, a socio the socio political context as people involved at the library, and coordinating with other community based events? It might be a pride, it might be an LGBTQ organization in your community, things like that. Next, please. Um, so one of the things that, um, and I know that Tammy has some really great examples of this a little bit later, um, is increasing visibility of support and acceptance. We could have um, a space full of accepting people, but if we don't show in some ways that we are supportive people, the youth don't know. One of the things that youth tell me regularly is that they're on the lookout. They're always looking for these little bitty signs. Does somebody have a rainbow flag on their desk? Does somebody share their pronouns? Does somebody have a pronoun pin? Like all of these kinds of things um, are subtle messages that, well, they're not so subtle, but they're a little subtle depending on how we do them, um, that we are affirming and safe for LGBTQ young people. One of the things that I add is that we need to be explicit about our non-discrimination policies in whatever way we can, recognizing the context matters, um, but letting folks in a group or um, having it up on our website, whatever it is, know that this is a space that is accepting of all of these identities. This isn't just specific to LGBTQ here. Next, please. I also want to really engage youth in leadership, which I know you all are doing amazing work on already, just in the, the conversations that I've had as we prepared for today. Um, so thinking about how can we support LGBTQIA youth in taking leadership opportunities in ways that are really meaningful and important to them, and then also are safe for them. How can we ensure their safety as they engage in leadership? Um, so as adults in the space, right, making sure that youth are protected, they're getting the resources they need, um, but that they're really getting the opportunity to lead. Um, and you'll hear some more examples of this later on. And then I always like to talk about, you know, creativity and the arts, because I think this is a piece that um, I think you all are doing really, really good at from the work that I've heard. And I think in some spaces, it's like, well, we need to provide a support group, we need to provide education, and those are absolutely needed. And like, we can do those things and engage 
in more artistic ways with young people. Um, so if you do have a local pride festival or a parade or other LGBTQ events, find out how you can partner with them if you're not already. Um, or if you don't have anything like that, can the library support a pride month or an LGBTQ history month activities, right? Things like that. Um, and then thinking about different forms of arts-based programming surrounding gender and sexuality, um, which again, everybody has a gender and sexuality, not just LGBTQ people. So engaging all folks in learning about and engaging with these topics. Next, please. So I wanna briefly talk about rural communities. Um, some of my early research focused on rural and non-urban, like non-major metropolitan areas. Um, and so we know that for LGBTQ people, um, and sometimes more broadly, that rural communities are sometimes, you know, characterized by, you know, smaller populations. There's just a sense of like, everybody knows everybody else, everybody knows my business, things like that is what I'm hearing from young people. Um, limited access to resources, this could be healthcare, this could be other forms of resources, and often more conservative socio-political climates. Um, but one of the things that has been emphasized, not just in my research, but with other folks, is that we also have to look at rural communities from a, a strengths and resilience perspective, that there's not just bad, right? There's good and bad everywhere. Um, and so thinking about some of the positives of rural communities for LGBTQ people, um, there's some research that shows sort of strong ties to community. Not every LGBTQ person growing up in a rural community wants to run away to the big city. Um, some do and many don't. And so recognizing that we have to meet people where they are and there are people that want to stay or return to their rural communities. Um, and that LGBTQ connections in those communities tend to be stronger in some ways than in urban spaces. Maybe because there's not that many people there's lots of reasons why that could be, but recognizing that this, this sense of community um, is really important. Share a story about that later if we have time, but I wanna wait because I don't wanna take up too much space. So thinking about combining creativity and rural LGBTQ youth, I wanted to share one example. Um, this is a research poem. So I'm gonna read it to you here in just a moment, but this, all of the words in the poem came from um, youth in rural and small towns in one state in the Midwest. And they were sharing their experiences of growing up in a rural community, particularly around how they accessed support and communities. And then what I did was I took the words from their um, interviews and I put them in the form of a poem. So I want to read it to you because you're hearing a lot from me, um, an adult, and I think it's important to hear from the youth themselves too. I'm going to take a quick drink of water first. So as they're taking a quick drink of water, I would say this is the students' words through the voice of Meg, right? Yes. yes, this is all their words. I just put them together. Thank you for noting that. I see people on the street talking about how gay people are an abomination. There are some places that open their arms to LGBT people. Then there's some people that are just naysayers. It's not embraced or degraded. It's just there. Maybe... Maybe it depends on your kind of LGBT. You're popular, so you're cool with us. Sometimes I hate this community, but sometimes I love it. Growing up is so confusing. I'm just like everyone else. Sexuality is such a small part of me. I mean, we're all a little gay inside, but I'm the only out transgender person I know. It seems like there's no one in this town that's LGBT. When you're a gay kid, you depend on other people who are straight to accept you. You gotta be accepting, don't be an asshole. I should have warned you, I was using the kids' words, all of them. I've been pushed really far to the point of self-harming and attempted suicide. I don't have that many people that I can just talk to. Straight counselors, they don't know what they're doing. There needs to be a queer youth shelter. It would be so amazing. I enjoy meeting people who identify similar to me. It's like magnetism. My straight friends, they're cool. We don't go to gay lunch, we go to lunch. But sometimes they don't understand me. LGBT adults, I usually just go to people my own age. I mean, they're still adults, but knowing they're out and happy helps reassure me that it'll be okay. If I needed an adult, I would probably go to my mom. My mom is really mean about that stuff, but she let me stay at home, even though I'm bisexual. If you know where to look, there's queer stuff here. 
If you don't, well, you're fucked. We don't have any LGBT support in our community. Fridays, we go to the LGBT center, but it's 30 minutes away. I don't even know how to drive and I'm scared to open up. I wouldn't want people to think I'm gay. Besides, you can only meet people like that online. Tumblr, it's the gay person's haven. This was 10 years ago. And sometimes you get married on Facebook. I have some LGBT friends. I did go to my school's GSA, the library, slide please, the park, social media, Planned Parenthood, the LGBT center. It's pretty well a safe haven, but they need more transgender awareness. I kept wanting to come back. I'm not alone. You're not weird. That's nice. I'm more okay with myself. I learned to drag. If I can be confident in six inch heels with a wig on my head, I can be confident in my converse and no wig. I've gotten to love not only the sexuality side of myself, but also me as a whole. So I love that because it's it's all their words. I feel, I hope you can hear the teenager in some of the, the statements. I know I, I can hear them, but I also interviewed them. So their voices are still in my head. Um, this um, findings that I'm about to share are from the same study. So the poem and these findings all relate. Um, there were four primary things that rural LGBTQ youth said they needed. So they needed help with reducing isolation. They needed physical and online spaces to meet other LGBTQ youth. Um, they needed social acceptance and visibility. So we talked about this earlier, but um, this visible acceptance to counteract some of the discrimination and rejection that they were experiencing, um, more visibility of LGBTQ people in their communities, resources for emotional support and safety. Um, so some of this was mental health support, but others was just general safe spaces. And then help with LGBTQ identity development. So they talked a lot about, I just need to learn more about, you know, I know I'm not heterosexual or I know I'm not cisgender, but I just need to help figuring out like, where do I fall in that? And how can I, how can I learn? So we are going to take our first Q and A, Valerie G, or who am I moving it to facilitate that? Uh, Julia or Katie, do you see any questions in the Q&A or chat? Or if there is a question, then someone wants to drop one in now, this would be a great time to drop your question in or raise your hand if we can see you. Um, and also to stand up and take a, a, I call them blink breaks, a blink, blink break. And thanks, Meg, for giving us such a comprehensive example. Julia, Katie, do we have any questions? No questions that I'm seeing. Does anyone who's not stretching or running to the restroom have a question they want to ask? We'll have another chance for questions at the end as well. Yeah. There is one Q and A. Oh, it says the chat is disabled. All right. Well, then let's. If you have questions, could you put them in the Q and A section? And okay. we will see about any. Thanks, Jean. Uh, Jean has a question. Um, so Jean says, I'm interested in displaying a pride flag, but was told I should have training before doing so. Is this accurate? So Jean, are you saying is is having the training first or are you asking if attending this, this professional development serves the purpose or are you asking about both? While Jean is clarifying, uh, I can, can you hear me? Oh, yes, we can. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't hear. Can you hear me? Yes, Jean, we yes. can go right ahead. Um, so what I was told I wanted to hang a pride flag outside my door, but then um, a person had mentioned, oh, you should really do training before you um, get a flag and hang it up. And, you know, I consider myself an ally um, so I was just wondering, I've done lots of different trainings on LGBTQ plus issues, but, um, I didn't want to like, um, you know, I wanted to make sure I was being supportive and doing it in the right way. I'm happy to share my initial thought and then would love if Tammy has thoughts on that as somebody doing this work too. Um, 
I think that the, the goal is that if you're putting up a rainbow flag, that you're prepared to provide a safe and affirming space. And so for some people might need that training first, I think for others or that have already been doing the work or going to trainings, you don't necessarily, it's not like a requirement. I just would say like, if you have it, be prepared to like enact that allyship, right? In whatever way that that looks like. Tammy, what do you think? I agree. Um, and you had touched on it earlier in your presentation as far as the tiniest um, symbol or even a sticker. Sometimes if I have that in the space, a teen will see that and that just affirms that they know they're okay. So if you're, I don't think it has to be, and I'll talk more about it when I show you my examples, but it doesn't have to be something super big. You know, you don't have to put a full blown flag, but, and I'm not sure what training you would have other than knowing your own self, as far as what does that flag mean when you put it out there? And if it means that you're welcoming them, then what you don't need training on that. You need to just hold that to yourself. Yeah. I would just add, you know, in relation to to what both Tammy and what Meg said is that, you know, sometimes as I mentioned, you may become an ally organically or just by nature of being a person who's open and welcoming to everybody. And so you indicate that not just by your flag or your book, but by your behavior. And so I come to this work um, as a developmental psychologist who focuses on race and identity and adjacent to that are these other identities, which includes um, sex and gender identity. And so sometimes we make mistakes, right? So sometimes we don't know all the terminologies. And I myself am guilty in, in planning this term and, um, and planning this webinar and being excited and having worked on a brief that talked about best practices for working with LBGTQ plus youth and, and misusing the wrong pronouns. So you can be an ally and not be perfect. And you just want to own that. And as much knowledge and information as you can get, you want to own that too. So, you know, if a flag makes you feel like those young people who don't know you're an ally will, will help them to know that, great. Um, but your behavior and how you welcome people is really where people will feel like I can just talk to this person, particularly young people, because we often talk within TRL about creating safe spaces, right? And those safe spaces include us as individuals. I think we have a few more questions before we move on. I know that Tammy has some great examples and that's often a question we hear, but what does this look like in my library? How do I do this in my community? And Tammy is always a rock star. Um, so is there another question or two we wanna answer, Katie or Julia, before you, we jump back to the deck and we're finished our blink breaks? I only just had one thing to add and I know that we've spent a lot of time on Jean's question and we need to move on soon, but... I was just going to say, depending who said that, it could also be an invitation for you to get curious about what more you could do if it was a young person who is queer, part of the LGBTQ community, it could have been feedback. Um, and we can just, like Valerie said, we, we can call ourselves allies and try to create a welcoming space and still make mistakes. So depending who the feedback was from, it could be an invitation to be curious about, you know, ask them, follow up. What more do you think I could learn or do? Absolutely. And Jennifer, I think that's great, you know, that the young people saw the flag and were able to identify. Um, so sometimes it's, that's enough in the community that you're in and other times there might be other things, but certainly you're welcoming, you're being welcoming is, is super important. Thanks. And we'll have another period of question and answers as we dive into more examples and try to make sure that we're connecting this to what does this mean and how does this look in, in the PA humanities community. Yep. All right, we'll go back to our deck. Valerie, you are muted. Thank you. So Tammy is going to share her examples of Teen Reading Lounge um, that she has been working with young people in the Airy community at her at the Airy Public Library. And um, this should give us some more practical examples of what this looks like, not just as adults leading, but what it looks like when you support the young people and put them first. Tammy? 
Hello. Um, I'm very happy to share um, just a brief glimpse because we, I could talk for days and hours and everybody knows that. I will. But I am continually learning and adjusting my approach based on team feedback. So I've been doing this work for eight years at the library with TRL and um, who I was eight years ago is entirely different and we all continue to grow hopefully and evolve. And um, with the team's help, it's a lot easier because they, once they realize that they're able to have, you build that relationship with them, they will not hold back on telling you when you're doing something wrong or offensive or how something might've changed. And um, it's, you have to have broad shoulders and be very accepting because what they tell you one day might be different the next day. And you just need to accept them for that. Um, the signs, and I, pictures, um, the welcome teen sign is just something that we have in our space. We're very fortunate to have a dedicated teen space in our library. Um, we made that space and involved the teens in every part of the designing and planning process. It's a very inviting space and I spend more time than I would like um, welcoming people to other parts of the <laughs> library who are younger or older who want to be in the space. But it's very cool and the teens help make that happen. Uh, we have signs, displays, art materials for um, a very diverse community. So when we were talking about, um, it's just one aspect of it, the space. We create a culture of welcoming. So when you're talking about that flag, that's something you can see, but it is also in our actions. If someone brings me um, a piece of art, I put it up. It is their space. They have to have the ownership for it. So that piece of art might have something to do with their um, sexual identity, or it might have something to do with, you know, one of their hobbies, but we still put it up. Um, we let them be involved in suggesting programs um, as much as possible and planning those programs, presenting the programs. I'm kind of jumping around, but I'm kind of, I want to give you just sort of a brief glimpse of our evolution. So these are just some of the signs that we have up. Um, this next slide are displays that I've done. And on the far left, the you belong at your library, that was my very first, I'm gonna do this. I'm putting up a display and see how it goes. And um, there was no pushback. And so then the next one with all of the, no, not the next slide. I'm just showing the next picture. Thank you. Um, with the rainbow streamers and the circles, we had the teens put that together. And then we proceeded to the having flags up and um, a full blown display. The one with the streamers is in our new teen space. Teen space and that is for, um, we try to do a photo opportunity. So there's always something that they can come in and take their pictures before they go anywhere. Um, okay, we can go to the next one. So the big story, I guess, would be on how TRL fit into the formation of our GSA. Um, the regional GSA was a culmination of discussions during TRL where the teens found out that they have very um, diverse and eclectic support for LGBTQ teens at their schools. Some of the schools had um, very formalized groups with teen leadership and you know meeting times and programs and activities. Other uh, schools had nothing. Um, some one other school had a covert art club that was for the LGBTQ teens, but they weren't allowed to talk about it, but it was a safe space for them if they were feeling bullied. Uh, as we're having these discussions, the teens realized, hey, this it's inequitable. Like, what are we gonna do? How, what can we do to help support everybody? And that was where we came up with the idea of having something at the library. The teens saw the library as welcoming for everybody. They knew that this was a place where if they wanted to put something together, well, they always ask. And then I say, yes. And how can we make it happen? What do we need to do? And then we go from there. Um, so in formation of the 
GSA, the regional GSA, because we wanted it to be open to the entire county. Um, in formation of that, I made contacts with local agencies because in our community, even though we are pretty big and on the um, map that Meg had up earlier, I was like wanting to have a lot of pride in the fact that we were colored as far as having supportive services and then knowing that the reality of that is on what day. So we do have um, policies and procedures in place in our county, but how that is actually enacted can be different, very different. Um, it's better than having nothing because we have the awareness and we have the groups formed and there's hope that um, we can have policies for protections for people. Now I kind of got off track, but I will tell you. Okay, so I made contacts with um, local agencies. We don't have anything in our, or we didn't at the time. This was 2019, 2018, 2019. We didn't have um, any community organizations for teens. So if they wanted to go and get health or medical or uh, mental health support, they had to go a couple hours to Buffalo or Cleveland. Um, and so that was another need that we wanted to address. This is um, our regional GSA, Marching in Pride. So that year, the teens really wanted to, um, oh, you're going way too fast. Just go back a second, because I'm going to keep talking. Um, this one. So this was the first time that they marched in Pride. And not only did they get to march, we had about 45 kids, um, teens show up for that. They also had um, activities and freeze pops, water, and everything at a um, tent. So there was a safe space for them to participate in Pride if they, you know, they could keep coming back to this home base where they knew there were um, adults that were there for them. Because a lot of them would not have been able to go to this if it wasn't a library program. So they were able to say, I'm going as an ally to support my friends and it's a library program and I'm volunteering at the library. And I'm not saying that we encourage people to be deceptive, but how we frame our experiences can be very helpful at getting to do things. So they would say, I'm going to the library um, to do this program and they get to be able to participate. You can pop the next slide, please, thanks. Oh no, yes, that way. Um, I always like to put this one in because they got to meet the mayor and that was like their rock star moment that they were included. They were able to do this as young people and that there were people in positions of power that were accepting and willing to um, celebrate them. So that was a very important aspect of that. Okay, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, so these are a bunch of pictures on this that you can um, look at. We did two really big years of going to Pride and having the teens decide what activities we we're doing, participate in every the planning, and then COVID struck. Um, so after COVID, you know, there was a online thing during that time. And when we, as a community, went back to in-person Pride celebration, a lot of the teens that were active in the GSA aged out of the system, graduated. So we had new teens that were involved, not as big of a group yet. Um, but I was full force thinking we're going to Pride, we're gonna do the same thing. And also after COVID, we had a new administration, a political administration. We had a new library director and I was told no. And it was the first time that I was told no that we couldn't do that as a library to go there and have a um, tent for the youth or you know pass out any information. But I was told that I was allowed to do anything at the library that I wanted to do, just couldn't go out in the community. And this was the teen's um, solution. We had pride at your library. And so I, again, collaborated with our health department and with some um, local agencies that came in and brought information. We had a chalk block, we had bead making, um, and we probably had about 40 or 50 kids attend this. A lot of them knew first time ever at anything um, pride related, first time for a library function. Um, and I honestly am fortunate, I don't have to do a lot of the work because 
when we were talking about um, your behavior, it is consistent and constant for me about what it what the expectations are of respect with the teens for each other, for myself, for just human beings. And probably one of the biggest gifts I've ever seen is when the teens, when I hear them saying something to someone that I know I've said a million times and I don't realize I'm saying, but that I just sit back and watch them. Hey, welcome. We're glad to see you. Is this your first time? Like, you know, you're, you're welcome here. What do you want to do? Who are you? You know, that sort of thing. And um, it's great to see that. So this was our way of pivoting to still being able to support. And then the bottom right one picture, you'll see a huge rainbow um, display. Like there, I made it out of a tablecloth. It's in the window of our team, team space, so the bottom right. And on that day that I made that and put it up, we were in the height of um, some opposition as far as having displays in the library. So that's something we could talk about at another time. But if you go to the next slide, please. Um, the following year, again, now we were allowed to go to the Pride celebration. Not only were we allowed to go, we were able to bring the bookmobile and we had tables for all different age groups of activities and books and resources that we have at the library. So that was a big win for us. Um, but it took a lot of pre-work. So when you're thinking about what can I do in my library, what do I wanna do? Set your goals and then work on steps to get there to make people just realize that that's what you're doing, that that's okay. <laughs> okay, next slide. Um, and this is our current TRL program um, project. So our group has decided that they wanted to do something to support LGBTQ youth. Um, this was something that they came up with on their own. You know, we did brainstorming about different social um, interests that they have and things that they might want to do in the community. And they decided that they wanted to help um, LGBTQ teens feel accepted. Um, they wanted to do it in a discreet way so that it wasn't like, um, but they also wanted to give them something to say, you're okay and you're loved. The, the picture on the left, these are folding envelopes, maybe, let's just say, that they're planning on doing in the different um, sexual identity, like flags, the flag colors. And inside, they'll have stickers and a book list. I don't have everything pictured that they're going to have in there because they're doing it next week. So they haven't created all of the book lists or resources yet. And um, we're going to have those in the library available available for them. And then in the Pride at Our Bay um, program this summer, the teens will have a button making booth and give these out to other teams at the program. Um, I will say that we've had some, one team that uh, is not gonna participate in this part of the project. So we've had some really in deep discussions with the teens as far as what does that mean when you're not comfortable with something, you know, what kind of, um, how can you participate still and still meet your belief system? And if you're not, I mean, those are the kind of conversations that we have at TRL all the time that give the teens um, a voice and being, allow them to work out things with the help of an adult to, that they might not even realize they're feeling or that they think. Um, so I'm pretty excited about this program, this project, and I think that I will probably end it there because there might be some questions, and I think I'm right at my time. Oh, last one. I'm not done. <laughs> um, this was just a sign that I have on my bulletin board that after the um, pride at your library, someone had left for me, tucked it under my door, and I, we get things like that, not as much because teens don't they're not practiced in the art of letting you know how much they appreciate you, but when they do, it really means a lot. And uh, I pr that's a prized possession, that along with the other ones. So know that, and I think Meg said some, somewhere, I heard this today about just 
The smallest thing with one person can make such a big difference. Oh, you did. You said there was 40% chance of um, helping a teen who might be suicidal. And I think that's important, not with just our LGBTQ youth, but every single person you meet every day, um, you don't know the impact that you might be making. And so I thank everybody who's out there that I can't see that is doing great work. <laughs> Thank you, Tammy, for such wonderful examples and for always doing such good work. Just thank you for caring. And we thank all of our registrants and participants today for caring and really wanting to understand how best to serve LBG LBGTQ plus youth and all youth across Pennsylvania. It's just so important that we um, help them to feel safe. And um, again, a lot of information. We have another Q&A coming up shortly. So if you have some questions or some comments that you want to share, you can either raise your hand or drop them into the Q&A and we'll be sure to get, get to them. I just wanted us to just take a, um, a short break to think about, well, not a short break. I'm making that up. You can take a blink break as I speak because <laughs> um, we will come to Q&A where you might get a, another wiggle and blink break. But I just wanted us to really think within context of what does this mean? So how does this relate to PA Humanities? How does this relate to what we've been doing and, and what we've been encouraging and lifting up in our work with um, young people across the state of Pennsylvania? So but certainly, as uh, Julia mentioned earlier, I started working with PA Humanities, gosh, of, oof, I want to say probably 10 years ago, um, and we were really just doing TRL. And we were doing the initial model of TRL, which was really um, just one genre of books. You know, at the, Harry Potter was was incredibly popular, the Harry Potter series. Most of our programming were in um, uh, uh, middle class and suburban libraries, and they were going great. They were doing really well. Um, but as we started to move throughout the state and, and reach into different kinds of communities, we realized that we could touch all young people. And then um, the researcher had in me said, well, let's look at this evaluation data. PA Humanities does a good job of collecting data on their programming and see which young people are being served the most. And what we found is the most diverse young people, though they may be smaller in numbers, um, who were being served by TRL at the time were the ones who were benefiting the most. And so through the data, we were able to say, okay, let's explain and our book list. Let's have a more diverse book list. Let's think about how we serve teenagers versus how we might serve elementary school age young people. And so a lot of what we learned today, and let's look at the multiple identities, the young people who come into our library. So there may only be one, um, one immigrant young person in, in your library services program, or there may be only one African American, or there may be only one LBCTQ youth who, who self-identifies and outwardly, you know, lets people know. But they should all feel welcome in your space. And so because of that, TRL, as Tammy said, her programs have evolved. TRL has evolved. PA Humanities has evolved to have the youth-led programming, which came out of our 10 years, what, what we learned, the 10-year learning brief from TRL. It came out of hearing from our librarians and our community partners about what the young people are saying. And so as a result of that, um, one thing that we often say, if not several, is that we, we want to create safe spaces. And that's what we heard in the examples, both from sort of what Meg shared, as well as what the, the practical examples that Tammy, Tammy shared. Um, and, and then we also want to make sure that, you know, we are welcoming diverse young people, whatever that means in your community. That's going to look different from, as we saw, from county to county in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, we want to use the humanities, right? We want to think about those books and those other resources. We want to think about the poetry. We want to think about our young people as contributing to making our community better, as leading in those spaces that we create for them, right? So we want to think about doing that. I'm looking at my notes because there were some good things that both Tammy as well as Meg said. We also want to make sure that um, when we're thinking about the systems, for example, what the ecological systems that Meg shared, uh, Tammy went on to say, at one point we could be part in the community outside of the library. We often talk about sometimes it's not the physical space of the libraries. And we talked about that during COVID 
considerably, right? So being able to be creative, <laughs> if you will, and some, sometimes innovative in how we serve those young people, as Meg also indicated, there's going to be some spaces where you can totally hang flags, you can totally have bulletin boards, you can totally have the space. And in other spaces, you're going to have to be creative about how you have those conversations and how you um, title events and activities that signal to young people that this is a good, this is a safe space, or even that they can get the permission to be in that space, right? Um, and also acknowledging that there may be conflict, right? Um, the books that you that the young people choose or that you you choose, knowing that what you choose might not align with what the young people want to do once they get to the place of um, of leading, which brings me to next slide, please. thinking about as is the learning group, the two things that I think come, come out clearly in today's workshop is centering diversity, equity, and inclusion, which includes LBGTQ plus youth, and also providing opportunities for youth to act, which we saw in examples that that Tammy shared, right? So the the envelopes that were put together, the presentations, even permitting the young people to, to march, bringing together the resources in the community. When we were pre-COVID, we I feel like we keep saying that when we were together, we were able to do these community mapping exercises. I think Tammy, you may have been at one of them and probably some others where we said, who are the people in your neighborhood? So when you're thinking about and uh, not just being an ally, but thinking about the support that you're going to provide to this community, it may be finding out who are the people in the neighborhood and the resources that are available. We'll talk about resources later, but are available to young people. So they may be the resources that are right there in your community, or they may be virtual resources. And I know both Meg and Tammy have offered some great resources that we'll talk about a little in a little bit. So making sure that one, we're centering that the experiences of the young people who are in our community. And even if we don't necessarily have young people who have, have identified or feel that it's safe to identify, finding ways to let them know that this is a safe space, that, that you're an ally. So it may be in the community where you can hang a flag, you can be very specific, but in other places it might just be the collection, right? And featuring several books, but making sure that one of those books speaks to the identity of those young people, right? That might be a strategy. So you may not be able to have a full book collection as Tammy had, but you might be able to have one or two of those books as part of a broader collection that indicates, hey, this is okay for me to be who I am. The opportunities for youth to act, once they catch hold of the idea that they have an adult who, this is Hart's Ladder of, um, excuse me, this is from the teen, um, the, the 10 years teen reading loud learning brief, but providing opportunities for youth to act comes directly or is co correlated with the Hearts led a learning brief. So once young people know that they can act and lead, they will go full force ahead and just need the support of adults. Next slide, please. Arts ladder. And so thinking about, which is why I have that so bolded. I know we sometimes struggle with how do we allow young people to lead? And we know that in some of the spaces where we're serving young people, there are restrictions, right? Because of the population we're serving um, or uh, because of the community in which we're serving. But as many ways, big and small, that you can allow young people to lead is really important. So as, we, as we've talked about uh, many times, thinking of Hearts ladder as either co-conspirating co or collaborating with young people or allowing them to lead and providing the resources that are needed um, in order for them to lead is super important. And we found that both in our in our TRL programming, which is why we have the Youth Lab Pro PA Humanities Programming Pilot, but also really affirms some of the work that's done globally around working with populations that are typically considered disenfranchised or alienated. And that would also apply to LBGTQ youth. So perhaps you have a student, um, a student board, right? Are, is your student board reflective of the young people who are running programs or participating in programs in your library? So you may be in a community where you can have a GSA, but if you're not in a community where you can have a GSA, but you do have a youth led board, are the youth that come into your spaces representative? So do you have an LBGTQ plus young person on that board, right? Do you have them helping you to make decisions and think about what kinds of programming need and resources are needed? So making sure that that voice is a part of it and allowing them, the young people themselves, to tell you what is needed. Um, I also like what Tammy said, even doing hearts ladder is going to cause some friction, perhaps with um, yourself and figuring that out. But definitely sometimes with colleagues where they, why are these young people leading? But knowing that sometimes when we make the decisions to put young people first, 
not all of our colleagues or community members will understand it, but figuring out and, and affirming or knowing that that really allows young people to grow the skills needed to, to be the leaders of today and tomorrow. So those are some things that I wanted to point out. Um, and yes, I wanna make sure I have all my points. Yeah, so those are some things I wanted to point out and kind of bring together. And then when we do this in practice, what does this look like? How do we try to connect with young people or encourage you to be reflective about your practice, as well as encourage you to um, make sure that you're hearing the voice of young people? We do the mirrors and glass activity, right? We encourage you to do that. We encourage you to do the rosebird and thorn when you're reflecting on how did a program go or what could change or what could be different. So not just for you as a practitioner, but to do these activities with the young people, right? And again, I, I'm going to always say youth leading. Sometimes you're helping them to develop the skills to lead, but giving them that opportunity to lead is, is, is super important. So when we model these things, just, you know, helping young people to being these spaces with us and helping us to be reflective about our practice and figuring out what is it that we need to change to um, support these young people as they come into our library spaces and our community spaces. Julia, did you, is there anything that you wanted to add at this point? I think, you know, just, I feel like you covered a lot. I would say just the, um, being the part about listening to young people and giving them a chance to say what they need um, and being willing to learn. Um, I think having that kind of, we talk about it a lot in Project Ready, the idea of cultural humility and mm -hmm. just, you know, showing up as adult allies that are willing to not know everything yeah. and keep learning. Um, and also because language and identities keep evolving. And so um, you mm -hmm. could create a safe space without knowing the latest um, definitions, which I'm always learning from my own kids um, and being willing to, to listen and learn um, mm -hmm. to what they wanna share with you. Because we all have multiple identities and in some spaces, one is more prevalent than the other, right? And so understanding that young people are also are also growing and developing, quite honestly. So one of the things that Meg said earlier was this idea that these laws and these legislations don't only affect children, they affect adults. But I think where we create the safe space, whether virtual or physical, and the libraries are perfect to learn and understand, even to figure out how these laws come about and how these book ban movements come about, you know, we can learn from the resources that are in our library. And we, we also want to be thinking about you know, how an adult is able to navigate those spaces, as Tammy also mentioned, is different from how a young person can navigate those spaces. So as those allies, as those, as those allies, as those community spaces, really thinking about how we um, allow for safety of these identities, right? Because how an adult navigates is going to be different from how, and their ability to navigate is going to be different from how an adolescent is able to navigate and seek out and identify sometimes the resources that they need to either feel safe or get 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 the get what they need. As Julia said, what what do they need? So really listening for that, and sometimes that listening is visual listening, right? So paying attention to the body language, paying attention to what they're not saying. Um, and checking in. So just wanted to make sure that we're thinking about, you know, well, what does this look like in TRL? Uh, next slide, please. So we did say that we wanted to make sure that there was ample time for questions and answers. We gave you a lot of information today. We've got uh, some delightful resources to share with you as well. Um, but are there any additional questions or comments that you want to share or things that you want to know more about that we can we can give to you today while we're together before we move into resources? Julia, Katie, do we have any questions or comments? I don't see any. Okay. Meg, did you want to jump in? Anything that you wanted to share? Any additional examples do you want to add on before we jump into resources that 
I don't think so. I was just blown away by the work that Tammy does. So I just wanted to give you a little shout out because I think I worked a lot with libraries in my early research and like something the kids always said was like, that was the place. And even, even more recently working with youth to organize some community-based resources, it was like, where do you want to meet? And they're like at the library, right? And so it's just such a critical space. And so just, you're doing great work. So thank you for that. Yeah. Thanks, Meg. Thanks, Tammy. Okay, uh, do I see a Q and A? I said I was. Tammy, this question is for you. I can't sing. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hi, Tammy. Thanks for sharing your examples. I'm starting a LBGT, LBGTQ. There's letter missing. I'm sorry. Uh, the G is okay. LGBTQIA plus group here at HTFL called all those acronyms out at the library. How do you deal with any community pushback? Great question. We faced some serious issues a few years ago during Pride when reading Gender Queer as our book club pick. I'm worried about exposing you to these issues. So Tammy, I'll ask you the answer to that first. And then I know you've had some experience with that as well, Meg. So if you would share, um, if you would both answer that question, please. Tammy? I am. I'm looking at the question again because how do we deal with community pushback? There's some, um, well, in our library system, we did have a great deal of community pushback. We don't have enough time for, but I will go over it quickly. You can Google us. Um, there was a complaint about a um, display in our library and it was taken down by administration. The community rallied and we had some read-ins where they um, actually came and read and put up signs. And it has been ongoing for the last year. How our library ended up handling some of that is that we met and reviewed our display policy and it took a long time, um, but it really pretty much mirrors our collection development policy, which is I guess in the base, most basic thing is that we are going to include materials and programs to um, be inclusive to everyone, and that we're not going to exclude information that may offend one or another group. So we want everyone to be included. We're going to have information and things to fit everybody's needs, hopefully. Um, but if you don't like something, then you don't have to read it or you don't have to um, go to that program. So I guess just being consistent with your policies, having something written out is gonna be, you need to have a foundation to stand on and just be able to refer back to that to support yourself. Um, as far as the book clubs, um, when I had a Pride Reads book club, which was going to be just centered around LGBTQ titles and characters, I didn't get as much um, attendance or interest. But when I have book clubs that the teens just get to pick their books, those are often books that they pick that they're interested in. And then people who might not be coming for that certain thing get to learn and experience those types of topics, if that helps and Meg, you probably have some like official answer better. I, don't know. <laughs> I have nothing <laughs> official. This is all, no. Um, no, I think that that's great. And I think it's important to note that like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where we live and context matters, but like the community pushback can happen anywhere. You know, I was in a really liberal progressive community. It was like the blue bubble of Kansas, right? And like, there were still protests at the library when they held drag queen story hour, right? And like things like that. And this is, uh, a city that theoretically anyway prides itself right on no, no pun intended with pride but like prides itself on inclusivity and like equity and all of those kinds of things and it still happened and so um I think that what Tammy talked about is really important that like our library policy is x and that's how we enacted that um I also think in working with youth that like prioritizing safety right that if if there's an issue that I as the staff or and I did this as a faculty member too, if I'm working with young people or even with undergraduate students, like I'm in, I'm in charge here, right? Like, I don't like to use that language, but if it's a matter of like the press shows up or there's somebody being hostile in the space or whatever it might be that like, I'm gonna address that or I'm gonna get some other folks to help address that, that that's not on 
the young people that their leadership does shouldn't put them in harm's way right and so if it's that level of like pushback I think recognizing like being prepared for that thinking through potential um processes for if this happens how are we going to deal with it usually it's like rude comments on a Facebook page or like an email not like I mean lately it's more people showing up but I guess like it's more likely to be you know you advertise it on your social media and somebody makes a snarky comment right and so deciding as a staff like how are we going to deal with that are we ignoring it and deleting it are we responding like having a plan for those kinds of things and just being prepared in this political climate I would be surprised if it wasn't happening um, regardless of community so I don't know how um, official or uplifting that was but I think it's just being prepared and having a plan for what you're going to do I might just add three things that I've heard and that I want to um, lean into is safe creative you've led, right? And and what makes it is kind of reflects what I said, how adults navigate these spaces is different from how young people do. And if it's you've led um, or you're attempting to give you the the the, the space for, for it to be led, just making sure that we are being considered of safe and that's going to look different in every community. Um, and that when it's youth led, that we still are adults helping them to navigate and sometimes buffering some of the experiences that they don't necessarily have to have at their age. Um, they can be focusing on some of the other things that are more important to making sure are part of the community and the library as a, you know, a, a space where the humanities lives, really an example of where the humanities lives and where you can dig into not only the identities and expression and the feeling welcome, but understanding. Sometimes it, it takes understanding the opposing, or not necessarily opposing, but alternative um, perspectives. Not necessarily that they might change your mind, but at least you, you, it gives you an idea of where is this push coming from. So super important. And then I would also say I would, you know, Meg is a social worker. I'm a, a psychologist, but more importantly, I'm, I'm a member of the Society for Research on Child Development. And there are several briefs, which is how I came to meet Meg, that have come out related to what Tammy said. That are like here are some evidence based practices for working with. Um, transgender youth. Here's some ways that COVID impacted LBGTQ plus youth. Um, here's some best practices or things to keep in mind when you're developing services, or even if you're having that pushback and you want to move, uh, attempt to move out of the emotional conversation and say, here's what we know about serving young people, right? Because it's, sometimes it's the emotional conversation that's elevated, but we do want to be able to say, well, we know that if they can get quality health care, that's important. We know that if they can just see themselves, that's important. Here's how we know. So we have two two-page briefs that we'll make sure it's a part of the resources that you can get and share, one for your own education, but also if you find that you're in conversations with people who are saying, well, where's this coming from? You can say, well, there's actually evidence that supports this, including the work um, that Meg does, the practical work and the poetry that she shared today, which is part of one of her um, publications. So we we know we're winding down to time. Um, was there anything else? There might be one more. Okay, you're welcome, Jennifer. Um, if there's any other questions or things that you want us to address, drop them in the Q&A. Julia, is there anything else that you want to share before I, I pass the picture back to Meg and Tammy for some resources? Um, I just want to, I know that we're a little over time, so um, acknowledge we'll, we'll also be sending out the resources if we don't get to go over them today. And thank you all so much. Thanks to everyone who attended. Um, thank you to our amazing panel and moderator. Um, such great examples of ways to use the humanities to create safe and welcoming spaces and all the reasons why <laughs> um, and just more knowledge to have um, for yourselves and your own exploration and identity understanding and also to understand the young people that you work with and support. Thanks everyone. So thank you for joining us. And Katie, if you can just pitch us to the thank you and be in context slide in case someone wants to see that and jot down an email address really quickly. But otherwise, we thank you for spending uh, part of your morning and your early afternoon with us. We've got um, some great resources that we will share with you via the slide deck. There are Piper links so you can click through to them. And then there's contact information for Meg, who is just a hop, skip away in Connecticut, for myself, 
for Julia, you know where to find her. And for Tammy, you know where to find her. But in case you don't remember how to find any of us, because you are just reveling in this wonderful information that you've learned today, um, the deck is here. And finally, on our last slide, keep in touch, follow PA Humanities. We're doing really good work and trying our best to serve all the young people across Pennsylvania the way they need to be served and ultimately loved. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm appreciative to my co-panelists for working with me through thinking through this. And thank you, Katie, for being our tech superhero. And we will see all of you soon. As I often say, be safe, whatever that means to you. Dance and laugh every day. Thank you for joining us here today at PA Humanities for this webinar on serving LBGTQIA youth and the humanities.